indeed, because it went quite back and forth. And to illustrate that, at two minutes in, Missy, you're very um, excited about the fact that the game might be over because Rocket <laughs> incorrectly bounced the, the wave. Yeah, this game is over. Well, he this says it's over, over all the quote. time, but well, yes. But let's take a look at that, uh, at that replay because I thought okay. it was really interesting how you identified that they did this wrongly and that would influence the rest of the games. So in lane sub, what you want to do right now is both teams mirror each other and just play the replay. Uh, basically, you want to bounce this wave so that the next wave comes towards you and all this farm, the, all these blue clips that are pushing towards the tier 2 tower for the enemy are, are, are gone, are basically just di died to the tower and therefore you're denying XP for the enemy. Right now, while pushing the wave that way, they lost one level on Kalista mm -hmm. and two waves, which already put them really far behind. Yeah, we were also just talking about how both team comes. Uh, they wanted to swap as well, you know, H2K. So not only were they benefited by the swap, the fact that then Rocket failed the bounce unit was only playing in their favor. So that it, combining then that the average, you know, strategic play from Rocket wasn't the greatest was definitely a big advantage for H2K. What was quite interesting is that you were also mentioning this is really good for H2K because the mid game is coming faster for them. They can group and that benefits their composition. However, what were the problems there? Because it was within 1K for 25 minutes of the entire game. Did they not know what to do after? Uh, I actually want to praise Rocket on this one because what Rocket managed to do really well is like when you have these fast lane swaps and you take down early towers, the map is often very open very quickly and you get a lot of focus around mid lane and Rocket are understanding that, okay, Jace is obviously going to hit a power spike in mid game, Cork is going to do the same and you're going to start group and sieging. So they constantly kept a lot of watch actually behind the mid lane and when you run double teleport on Quinn, on Lissandra, there's so many flanking opportunities. So every single time H2K actually stepped forward in the mid lane, there was the chance of Betsy flanking or Freddy flanking and it caused a lot of big team fights that were very even for almost the entire game long until the very end where we didn't see obviously H2K start outplaying Rocket in some of these fights here. People get caught out a little bit. Safi in the last one ends up dying to Poppy. But I actually think Rocket did a very good job setting up these wards and therefore using double TP very effective to shut down the, the siege. Sadly for them it didn't result in a win. I think they did a really good job at setting up flanks to, uh, to avoid the sieges. But I think that the main problem that caused them not to be able to siege so well was the fact that mid lane uh, lost a lot of pressure with the first death. It, it made Lissandra be able to push first the waves and not let uh, H2K create waves for them to push on because Lissandra had the pressure in mid. Yeah, that was a very interesting thing because Auto Omni had a few TPs in the early game where we were kind of questioning a little bit why is he TPing in here. There was one where they try and stop a push on bottom lane. He actually ends up doing absolutely nothing, which opened up for the Quinn also to start roaming. And there was no response from Auto Omni. He was just stuck in a side lane all the time. And I really like the roams from Freddy. He's normally not much of a carry player. But he had an okay, at least, early game. We just didn't get to see much impact from him later. But again, he was forced into team fights very often. And it was kind of H2K still running around the map deciding the fights and then always flanks happening from uh, from Rocket. I, I definitely liked how he how he played this game. I think he played a pretty pretty good Quinn and he created a lot of pressure for H2K. He catched both side lanes, had a lot of farm advantage at some point and was just really, really annoying for H2K. I'm just still not sure of his build. I don't think that Hex, Hex Drink oh, Rush was the, was the first item he should have bought. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my question. Yeah, H2K, I think what slowed the game down a lot was the fact that they stopped playing on the side lanes and that's something they stopped doing yesterday as well. They, Yeah, they couldn't really go there because of the threat of double TP, but they couldn't find an opening with slow pushes, so they had to force a fight, and that's what happened in the, in our second replay that we have, is that Oduamna finally finds an opening, and he repeats that in a lot of fights later on. So he's going to just charge in onto Airwax. We can roll the clip immediately, and we'll see exactly what happens here. He's just playing unrelenting aggression overall. Goes in the pillar setup from Vander too. Just Prevent, it, makes it for a lot of plays. It prevented the flash. Graves wanted to flash yeah. there, but the, the small knockup of the pillar basically prevented him from flashing the, the E of Poppy and just... Yeah, just snowballs into the Baron right there. So yeah. that was really good synergy, snowballs good pillars from Vander overall. And finally, H2K find the opening. They chase down Saphir here. Look at Betsy at the top of uh, your minimap too. He's looking for a flank opportunity on the Baron. So he was in prime position to stop that Baron. But then the other side of H uh, from Rocket slightly overcommits and I don't think we can praise Odo enough for some of the engages that he's done in this very lackluster side wave management from H2K as a unit, but he definitely kept going in in the later parts of the f later stages yeah. of the he fight. Tried he tried to finish carrying. it on but himself as well. <laughs> this right here is Rocket in a nutshell. Again, we see so many good things early to mid game, where like the way they're setting up to like allow Betsy to be a carry. Again, Freddy had a good start on Quinn and so on. 
But then once we hit late game, again, I'm not sure what's happening with the team, but they seem to just lose complete focus of what is going on. Like that last replay we show, Extinguish popping his ulti on Alistar, and Seth is then pulling him in at the same time. Well, like, misplays like that are just not acceptable in the late game. But it's, it's just this... The, the, how, how many games have they played together? Sure, yeah, again, it's new, new, new support, of plus, course. Plus, he was a mid laner before. They, they probably have uh, synergy <laughs> issues, you know? <laughs> yeah, but, of course. But I definitely think that uh, Rocket played very well to, uh, these two days, early game, but it's just they just lacked on the mid game. And what comes down to a maturity of a team there, because on the side of H2K, they also had to play with an emergency sub in Selfie. How do you think they went around that problem? You mentioned that they went mid lane a lot more and didn't show that same level of strategy. How else? I just think we, we can see or perceive the impact that Ryu had in the mid game in terms of shot calling, because H2K in both games yesterday, we were joking joking around how it turned into an ARAM, and this game, a lot of the action was centered around mid lane. Yes, it is very hard to play into double teleport, but you can still set up slow pushes in the side lanes and use that pressure to then go around the map. H2K seemed to be slowing down in the in their big picture strategy game, waiting just to force a fight, waiting for somebody to make a mistake and act on that, whereas the H2K of the past few weeks was proactive. Mm. I think the, the, main, the main issue between Selfie and Ryu I don't really believe it's shot calling. I think the main problem was that Selfie just, just lost mid lane both games. And what that caused was them to have not enough mid lane pressure for them to use their siege comps to group up mid and siege because their enemy mid laner just had too much pressure. The Fischo, was it shot calling or losing a mid lane? Uh, uh, maybe both. I mean, you can <laughs> take yeah. mix, yeah, honestly. I also firmly believe if a team has good overall shot calling, it's because every player understands what to do when you make a simple call. So if, like, Myth is calling Dragon, his entire team knows what to do. Okay, push out your waves, you know, have recall in time, set up these, these wards. Yeah, I think H2K can do that as a team. The game yesterday, though, is so interesting because from my point of view looking at it, I felt like them being passive was okay because they were outscaling. Both they teams, were they were both teams felt that. I feel like both Vitality teams were... Vitality were the one messing up in, in that department, at least, if you look at But if you look at opinion. the scaling from both team comes, they both could have had arguments into why they wanted to slow down the pace. Because if you look at the last fight, the difference between Ace in either direction was Selfie dying, and that difference was 170 HP. So... I mean, I, I'm I looking at H2K, Caitlyn, Gangplank, to if me. You, if you looked at the damage, the biggest damage done there was from Hyaren, and he had more damage than any other carry on the other side of the team. He, it was fine to forgiven, but for Hyaren this time. So he was straight up carrying... I think they had enough damage to murder the team fight because there was no tanks on H2K's side. In these late-game explosive fights, it's just all about positioning. And I think both teams were just too afraid to make a mistake or make a play. Uh, but it, it could have gone either way. I mean, you can't say that that team fight was convincingly won. At least we can say, had that team fight happened 10 minutes earlier, HSK would have lost it straight up. Yeah, true. Completely. So them waiting it out and out, or trying to outscale at least gave them a better chance of winning a late game team fight. Obviously, again, we, we heard from Proly a little bit, and he wasn't too happy because he felt like they were too passive. But in that case, again, it, I didn't mind it, also because you're playing with a new mid laner in this situation. Yep. Play safe. But obviously, don't play too passive that you don't do anything. Yeah, however, it came pretty close. As it I said, did, yes. it, within 1k for 25 minutes of a game versus Rocket, where you get that lane swap and you get that advantage, can't, I mean, I, it's still the mid laner coming in. It is a substitution. I it think is. we can forgive them. They are still 2-0. They are 2-0. They can be happy with their week. But yeah. obviously, there's a lot of things to work on now. And then we got to see when Ryu can be back for the lineup. Indeed, but let's take a look at the standings because there's a third of the splits game behind us already and it's G2 and H2K who are riding high in first place and at the middle of the table. Vitality, UOL at 4-2, and two, Rock at 1-5, Giants 0-6. Oh let's start um, with G2. Today they had the game of the week versus the Unicorns of Love and it seems we're coming to the consensus that this is a team that is on the top to stay. Um, what could be their downfall for you guys w or what makes you say that they belong there, Deficio? Um, I think what we see from G2 now, also with some of the new composition they are playing, this is something Perk said himself in one of the interviews, is that you have to be able to play different comps in this current meta. And they're showing now different things. They're showing these poke comps today and, and yesterday against Fnatic, you know, Corky mid lane for Perks. So I think individually, these players will always be very good. I love how you're highlighting the two mistakes G2 made, that <laughs> game, by the way. Well, <laughs> we have the 3v4 in the bottom where they could have disengaged, and then we have the Baron throw. But overall, it does show that G2 as a team is not afraid to go aggressive and is not afraid to look for the outplay. And I think in this meta, you, you, you're better off looking a bit too much for the outplay than too little. I just want to say there are a few times where we do question really why do they make that play? Where either they don't have teleport or it's like a 3v4, but they are super, super acro and you can surprise teams by being so aggressive very, very I think the biggest weakness of uh, G2 right now is 
A, their top laner. I think that he's in most of the games. They obviously they have won nearly all their games, but uh, the one that has been struggling the most is him. But he has in, uh, he he's basically changed roles, so he has a lot of time to learn. And the, the other weakness is is just like just being a bit more cohesive and just trying to tone the pace of the game a bit down and trying to like calm down because sometimes they just get struggled with double TPs a lot. That, yeah. that's that's the only again it's it's a young team yeah. and i'm sure if we listen to the to the communication there's a lot of yelling going on when they start getting these kills and like move forward move forward and then tp happens behind you and you get surprised so are they at the top of the tables right now because the level of the lcs is going up or because it's still developing and it's not there yet i think oof, what do you think both i think they're really good i think they're really good up and coming team they can become much much better i don't think they're at their full potential or anything close I but I think other teams are learning too. Sorry. <laughs> what do you think, Rafa? Uh, I think a lot of things. Uh, yeah. Just, I think they got uh, not lucky with the meta, but it seems to suit the type of players they have. So in perks of like these players that want to go aggressive and ha have good mechanics, in Emperor, who's like he likes dashing forwards for trades overall. You have Hybrid, who's good peeling support, but also just has good mechanics. The meta right now is a par strategy. But it's also just going for these plays and just working together and knowing how to play fights. Like I think this is the fight where just earlier. A couple moments before this, Perks turned around, you know, and, and went for the kill. Many other players would have disengaged, but he's not afraid to turn around in a disengaging fight to then trade forward with that Corky. Yeah, it's easy because Corky, but um, I just like the style they're bringing to the table. And they seem to have some growth left. I don't think they're anywhere close to their ceiling, and I like that. Definitely. I think they are the kind of team, though, who always will do extremely well in the start of a split, where every other team is kind of slowly getting into it. And often the early games we see in the split have... A lot less strategy and a lot more brute force. Like, you can basically win the game almost by making one or two good individual plays very often. So I wonder if G2 as a team can move past just being extremely good individually and have, like, these crazy plays they're trying to make, like perks going 10-1 and whatever it is, and learn a little bit more overall strategy and just become very clean in the way they're playing. Because I think that some of our other top teams will pick that up coming towards playoffs and then I think we've seen in the past when teams are extremely strong and aggressive in the start and like everyone is kind of you know finding their, their place they do well but they want to hit playoffs and they best out of fives and the adaptations they tend to fall down a little bit if they didn't improve and at least learn more overall strategy than just purely playing around being so super aggressive and having very very good players I think as long as they're fo they focus on their mistakes and yeah. actually improve from them like the whole TP situation just not not being like not not being aware of what the enemy can do although they get a really good advantage every time you know and they punish uh, enemy mistakes they just try to have to try and make less mistakes and that's all that's all they need I think they 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 can be a really good team and they're there to stay if we expand that, G2, also H2K at the top of the table, strong individual play, strong macro play to work on and working on mistakes. What what of those qualities do you see in other teams and what teams do you see rising to the occasion? OG, of course, 2-0 oh. this week. <laughs> Not, of course, OG, but 2-0 oh this week I mean, is what I meant. OG set them up to at least, they have a lot of mistakes now to work on. <laughs> I think, you know. <laughs> yeah. I think Unicorns of Love is yeah, a team. I who in some ways reminds me a little bit about eight of, uh, of H2K, where we look a lot at like the overall strategy right now for Unicorn Solo. I know it's crazy. What a difference a split Love. makes, indeed. I do think, however, they have the issue that if I look at every player and I match them against other players, I think some of the other top teams will have more overall talent. So if every team reaches the same level, if you look at just like how you play as a team on the map, I think Unicorns will then drop down a little bit because I think they're better players in all roles. I don't see like a Sven on this team, like a Forgiven on this team, uh, not specifically to highlight Stillback because he's been very good, but like Perks and Febivan and so on, these guys who are a little bit better than what we see in the Unicorn side, but I think right now they're playing some very good League of Legends. But that's that's the critique we had on Unicorns coming into the split. We said they had no carry and somehow they make each other better and they work well enough together to be at the top of the middle of the pack, if not at the top right now. That may that same critique may keep them from being a top three team, but it's actually very impressive what they've mm -hmm. done in such a quick turnaround. The way Hildesheim got yeah, liberated right now with those roster changes, maybe not just the AD carry, but as a unit. Like Hildesheim has been working together with Diamond Prox, with Vision, with Pix, and he got a new jungler, and that worked immediately. And, and Steelback. Yeah, and Steelback. With, with that Thresh Kalista was impressive. Yeah. Is that a testament, as you mentioned, of course, before already, that Hildesheim is really coming into his own? Yeah, definitely. And uh, uh, like um, addressing what Krepo said about them having no carry, I definitely think that uh, Visi Chachi has been stepping up a lot, especially in this week. I think he, he played very, very well. And I mean, 
maybe maybe they, they just need to like work a bit more on how to snowball their top laner because I think they had enough advantages on their top laners this this week to actually like go to zero. Big question mark then, if we talk about all the things good for those teams in the middle of the pack and at the top of the table, we talk about potential mechanical skill and mistakes in the game. Fnatic, yesterday we we lowered our expectations as a group about the team because we feel like we have to judge them on the project that they are that wants to come together at the end of summer. Do we have more question marks when it comes to the potential of the individual players that are in the team now that weren't there last year? I, I'll talk. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I mean, I, I'll get hate for it, but <laughs> no, no, I no. personally think that Fnatic is t is still, has still the possibility to be a very strong team, and I'm pretty sure they're probably going to end up top four if they fix their issues, but I still believe Huni, Rainover, and Yellowstar were stronger than the three members that just came in, and their new Fnatic is just a downgrade of the old one. Especially Spirit has honestly disappointed me a bit. Outside of the, the first game he played against Origin, we had a really good start. Like this week, Spirit in both games had many, many mistakes where he was positioning wrong on the map. And like he would get caught out, he would take random duels in the enemy jungle where his own lanes were already pushed up to their towers. And he's playing a little bit too much like Spirit of the Summer Split in LPL where he is like trying to be the solo carry all the time. He doesn't need to be the solo carry on Fnatic and he needs to change that. And yes, I mean, Huni compared to Gamsu, we haven't seen the same performance either. I'm just also just looking at the overall shot calling for Fnatic. Like, when we see the moves they're making in-game, it feels like they come 10 minutes later than they were supposed to arrive. They're also just skipping steps. I, I definitely agree with, with Spirit overextending. Like, we saw the, the overextending and the 0-3 grades in the early game. Today, as well, he was playing Nidalee. He was trying to poke way ahead of his waist, got caught by a binding, and they lose the momentum. But what strikes me the most is that Fnatic, they're skipping steps in the vision game. They're continuously going, they started that Baron four times in the span of like, what, six minutes? Playing against three blue trinkets without even pushing the waves all the way to the base. They had cleared the towers, all they needed to do was push, well, it's really simple, you know, but they needed to push in the waves, then take control of, of the jungle deeper and then go for the Baron. So, But they skipped a, a step and they just kept trying to bait the Baron or do the Baron and hope that the enemy team wasn't checking in with the blue trinkets. But that is too naive to play on this patch. Positive note on Fnatic though is that you're right, 100%, but they kind of just learned throughout the game how they should do it, and that just it, it's just a sign of a new team yeah, kind of learning true. their way through, because eventually they pushed out the waves, they, w they rushed the Baron, they got it before the other team could check it, because they... Wunderware did walk uh, all the way to... The, he was the only boot kit available, and he walked to clear bot wave without TP, but the Fnatic then did realize it, and they burned the Baron. It is just that we hold them up to the standard of last bit, and yeah. that perhaps is sometimes unfair to do because... We look at the name. The I mean, that's left. it. Yeah. We look that's, at Fnatic, it's we the look same at what we do at Or... Exactly. It's the <laughs> same what we do with Origin, and you guys are also dealing with growing pains. I mean, we've talked about it so many times already, the communication issues, and, and you've addressed it as well with the Baron play today. Overall, 2-0 still. We saw a lot of tweets from you guys yesterday that you weren't happy with your play. What's your main takeaway after this 2-0 week? Mm, I think we played better than last week, <laughs> and last week we played better than the week before. So things are going good yeah, in that easy. regard. I think we could still uh, do a lot more to just like play better. Like I think we could have uh, improved much, much more in, in the weeks we have had. But I, I don't know. Th things are things are getting closer to to the old OG, or maybe even better, uh, an even better OG. We will we will see. But what is the best element of the old OG then? What? was the thing about the old OG for you? So the thing with the old OG was that every, we got to a point where we were like trying to beat Fnatic so much that we just like tried to like copy everything they do and try to like learn from them, trying to make it better. And we just had this system eventually that I would just say, okay guys, we want to play for this side. And everyone would just know, the, know what to do. And there was like, we would just remind each other, hey, uh, you want to you wanna take this wave? Hey, you want to... There was no, like, I would call the plan and then everyone would just, like, do their own thing. Like, there was no really shot calling, you know? Everyone just knew and everything just clicked and this is what's missing right now. A lot of the community always talks about Power of Evil coming into the mid lane and Spec is stepping out. I actually want to hear from you. How much do you feel changing mid laners has, has done for you guys? Do you feel like it's, it's made you some negative changes or some positive ones? Like, do you feel like it's anything to do with Power of Evil getting into the mid lane or is it more the entire team? I think um, th there's there's two things. I think the team itself. I think we we are not performing to our level individually, and also like teamwork. Without counting power of evil, is is not the same as it was before. But uh, counting like talking about power of evil and comparing him to Peke now, I think power of evil overall. I, I mean, s sorry if I s like sound judgmental or anything, but uh, I think Peke was worse than power of evil mechanically. But he just 
uh, gave more to the team since we had been playing for one year. Mm -hmm. And as I said, we just clicked. He was like, he was like very into ha map movements and rotations and where he should be. And he was like playing very self-reliant and more towards the team. And Power of Yule comes from a team where he, uh, well, UL is doing great without them, right? But without him, but he just came from a situation where he he wanted to be the carry. He wanted to carry, and he uh, the team played towards him. And we we're just like he, we we're just like trying to teach him how to like how we want him to rotate and how we want him to move. Like there, you can tell from the game against. Uh, I don't even know who it was, but we just got caught aside, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I tried to, I tried to forget, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, we were just like, the, the main difference between, between both of them is that with OG, we, we, we would just like move better around the map uh, with, with OG, with Peke. And with, now with uh, Power of Evil, we are trying to get there. And he's learning really, really fast. I'm actually very impressed. I, I tell him anything, I critique him, I, 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 I get him a bit mad and everything. And yeah, yeah, I coach him, yeah, one could say. And, and he, he takes it, you know, he takes it and he's like, yeah, you're right, you know, tells me off when I'm being too hard on him or anything. So I think it's, go it's going good. I think it's, it's, it's going good. I don't know if you're at liberty to talk about this, but is there any kind of idea in the team or any kind of uh, arrangement that you know that Power of Evil is going to play most of the games? We know that Peke has been off doing a lot of ownership things, as he has to do, of course. But do you guys prepare every week with Power of Evil knowing that he's going to play? Right now, Power of Evil is playing. And it's going to come mostly down towards playoffs, maybe, of Spring Split. or And, and Summer Split is going to be 50-50 for sure. But it's mostly going to be... Uh, Towards playoffs or spring split, if things are not going the right way, then maybe Peke is gonna step up. Else, it's gonna be mostly power of evil. Then Peke maybe comes in for like a, a power pick or something, like just to put the enemy off in terms of like pick and ban. But mostly, uh, summer split is gonna be where where we're gonna try it out. Yeah, I definitely just want to touch on that whole like almost like muscle memory when some player says a certain thing, having your entire team react. Um, just the way you want to. I think that's what I, we we definitely what I look forward to tracking in a number of these teams towards summer split because the goal obviously for all these teams is to finish top three in summer. And I think a team like G2, if they get get, get a similar mechanism down where if hybrid says we play for this side, we play for that side, and the entire team reacts in the same way, that we could see uh, vast improvements in certain teams. That's quite interesting to me. You talk about muscle memory and the people playing together. You have uh, Sven on your team, obviously. Yesterday, it was Power of Evil on Lulu and Sven on Lucian. And that is one of those typical interactions that I think you have to be completely on the same page. Is that more Sven reacting and him just getting a shield whenever? Or is that the mechanics being right for both of no, them? No, no. There's actually no interaction. The, the interaction is uh, usually there gets to the point where... Uh, Power Hill says, okay, I have items now, and Neil <laughs> says, okay, okay, I can carry now, just speed me, and, we, and, I, and I will win, you know, and then, and then we just try to, like, uh, at some point, like, I personally, you know, like, uh, Power of Hill talks about, talks about it after the game, he's like, fuck, I was worried, I just ulted you when I couldn't have, you know, but for me, it's like, whatever, if you want to solo lose the game, and you want to just run into five people, then it's your fault, you know, and I'll just flame you after the game, and I'm okay with it, so Sven, I'm not stressed out when we play. Sven is the most confident player I know. Yeah. Like, every time I talk yeah. to him, he's like, you know, I can just carry against everyone, I don't care, I can, like, 1v9 everything. <laughs> Every single time. It's also sadly for him what gets him <laughs> killed quite a few times or sometimes. But so far, it's not really been any uh, game changing things. He's been a fantastic carry. And hey, the, the progression he's made in, in a year of pro play, coming from Challenger straight to Summer Split, straight to Worlds, I think he is, is one of the, the biggest discoveries, uh, almost equivalent to for me uh, to, to Fabian. When, if you compare <laughs> Fabian, when he failed to, I even think, get into the LCS once or twice, 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 twice with, you know, with H2K and then yeah. got in, and then how he started and where he is now. Yeah. Yeah. The, the players he is named amongst right now, compared to where he started, compared to like two years ago when he posted on Reddit as like the Riven one trick, that progression, I see some of the same in Niels. Discussion. Yes. Last right, year. <laughs> last year. Sorry to take you. you no, no. Up here, but <laughs> last year, who was the best? Fabian or Sven? Who had you know the most impact? Who was the most important player? Oh, that's the impact is something different. I know? mean, impact within the team. I think yeah, but like, like to me, that's a big I part of who. I was think the best I think it's an unfair question because uh, last year you, you asked about last year, right? Yeah, yeah. Last year, AD carry was more of a carry role than mid lane. Mid lane would just sit back and sure. farm and maybe get TP, you know, like like it was at Worlds. So. It, it's, it's just hard to judge. Well, we'll see. So it was the guy on his team. That's yeah, what he's saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's yeah, yeah. saying Sven. Uh, finally, maybe about Sven, something to illustrate his confidence. Last year at the summer finals over in Stockholm, before the final versus Fnatic, I was like, hey, uh, you know, how are you doing? And, you know, are you thinking of the gauntlet at all? Because if you guys didn't win, you had to run through the gauntlet to get to Worlds. And he said, I'm not planning on playing that one. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so, but I mean, it's something he... 
he can be like that at this point. Because Confidence he, is great because yeah. you can go on stage as a rookie and you don't care. You can honestly, your team can rely on you to play as good as you normally do. Yeah. And that's what uh, Sven can always do. Definitely. Good. He so backs it up, Sven though. is good. Yeah, sure. That's the thing. Yeah, there's a, there's a point where you need to back up the confidence with good play, and that is... So you can't always play on the front line at high or predicted dodge, but not... I, th <laughs> I think Sven plays f fantastic AD carry and he's really annoying to play against. I think Mithy shares some of the same traits where uh, going to the match, you'll always be confident. I don't think either of them are really prone to tilt. Well, I've that's changed. Ben, I've seen oh. Sven tilt once. Mithy wow. back in the day <laughs> wow, on super stage, that's strange, yeah. massive tilt. <laughs> No, like no, no. The it's, game, I think the term we use is just choke. Like He's choke. Just gone. Yeah, really? <laughs> we, uh, I, didn't, I didn't get that when I was playing against you. <laughs> ah, okay, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> you, you, can, you, can, you remember that part, man? <laughs> well, it's about uh, time to wrap that up and actually ask Mithy some more questions because earlier today we asked you to tweet your questions for Mithy with the hashtag AskMithy. And from at Katzlow wrote, with vision items being toned down in 2016, do you find it easier or harder to take control of objectives like Baron? Over to your interpretation. I think that vision items don't really m make any a any difference. It's mostly the the trinket, the orb, the, the the having three orbs instead of one that we had you had before, is the is the main difference in in terms of like controlling objectives, like Baron. Okay, anything to add, Krepel? Ah, it was that Mithy, wasn't that me? But I, <laughs> I, mean, I thought you wanted. <laughs> to no, no, I I like I think I think vision doesn't matter in terms of orb because both teams are operating with the same thing. Uh, but I do think blue orbs make it a lot harder to bait, uh, Barons. But I do think teams get rewarded a lot more for taking deeper control of a jungle behind the Baron because once you clear the blue orb sound, they still have to face check through all those pressures. Which is why we see more and more teams now switch over to yellow trinkets when they are in the yep. lead and they're the ones setting up the Baron because you can place those wards deep. Enemy team can't clear them unless they know it's there and they have to sweep it out. So like those are very important then to constantly bait that Baron because you got to get through like three blue trinkets and then you can get your Baron. If you do that, I mean, you deserve it. And didn't you also want to ask Mithy about the pink wards? Because we ran a stat here earlier in the show about the amount of pink wards that Kasing has. Oh, yeah, we already talked yours. about that off air, but I guess we should do it again. <laughs> yeah, it was very interesting. Okay. That's why I'll okay. bring it uh, up. So okay. the, <laughs> the critique is that there are supports in the LCS right now uh, significantly placing more pink wards, more importantly, because they're moving them a lot more. The death rates of pink wards is, is generally not because they're being killed, but because teams are repositioning them. Mithy, your take on it. So. Oh, <laughs> my call on it is I need my gold so I can carry so <laughs> fuck being worse <laughs> well there it is yep. that's I, it I don't, yeah, be careful with that language I almost got fired for that today as well <laughs> that's three on the day I think we I'm need to move on yeah. $500 fine here for me <laughs> there we go let's get another question in there one that could be very good for you guys playing a dynamic queue there Ska Vampire tweeted uh, when winning lane when and why are you leaving your ADC alone to start warding or roaming mm, so Usually what I do as a support is um, I uh, tend to push the wave in and then usually when you push the wave in to the enemy, like when you're ahead, usually you en end up pushing to, to the enemy. And what you do is when the wave is going to bounce back to you, you have this opportunity for your AD to stay in lane alone since the wave is going to bounce back to him anyway and he eventually can get it out of his tower to use that opportunity to roam either, to either alone or if you're playing in a team, usually you want to roam with your jungler, so if you catch someone off, you actually have more kill potential. That's basically the moment where you can roam off, get the wards, get the picks. Yeah. And especially the jungle support roam was like last year the big thing we were looking at so much and really started becoming more and more important because that also then means your AD carry is safe for sitting alone while you're roaming because you now set up these deep walls with together with your jungler and you just basically maximize farm on every lane by having support jungle getting deep vision. I mean, the, the general theory behind it is just that the sum of all the trades that you do end up in your favor. So you want you want to make sure that your AD carry, whatever he loses, gets made up at either the deep vision you get, the potential pickoff you can get in the mid lane. So it, it is very hard to talk about this in general because there's no right or wrong situation. It's just what you do with it. If you can get deep vision and it pays off in the end, obviously you want to roll. But the, the number one priority for, for newer players is make sure your AD carry doesn't die and that he understands that he is now playing 1v2. Because he will blame you if he dies. Yeah. Re re really? it, it's all about the wave. Like, honestly, if, if your AD is smart, he will just click at this tower and just stay there until you do your job. All you want to do is move when the wave is pushing to you. So your AD doesn't have to push the wave in and, uh, and get be in a bad position. But there's that's your just, first problem. Just make, make, yeah, that's for problem number one. Make sure you're back in time before they dive him. That is... Yeah, that's yeah. That's yeah. That is on you. If, if, if you are not in time when they dive them, then, then you <laughs> won't play that game anymore. Well, thank you guys.